On this episode of On The Tank Fuel, we catch up with Aditya Venkatesh, also known as Audi Photography. He's an Indian travel photographer whose work is connected with people from across the world. In true Audi fashion, he misses his flight coming in from Mangalore, which gives our team a few hours to kill. And so, we decided to rent some bikes from Wicked Ride and explore the Nandi hillside of Bangalore. This is what our early morning looked like. Once we were done fooling around, it was time to head back to the airport and pick Audi up. So this segment is called hashtag rant, hashtag rant, hashtag rant, hashtag rant. Or we can call it living on the edge because we're on the edge of a ledge. Safety notice, everything is safe. You yeah. won't fall more than two feet. Yeah. Depth perception seems to be a little off. As I can see a lot no of worry, depth for my perception. There's a huge continuation like this anyway. Okay. We met at Christ. University? That was the first time? No, no outside of Christ. Um, I had just dropped out of chart accountancy and then... Uh, you had just started your page? No, I didn't even start it You didn't yet. even start a page no, yet? No. Okay. This was before I started my page even. Okay. I had a group. This was before Pages Facebook. was introduced. Really? Yeah. Pages was introduced sometime in 2010, mid 2010. Huh. Before that I had a group. Okay. It was on my personal profile and then when Pages came, I kept my page ready but I didn't launch it. I remember Till I had some basic confidence. You weren't my first professional gig. That was Mount Carmel College. I shot there yeah. through Diren. Diren was this yeah. mutual friend who introduced us. Till that point, Akshay, uh, Mysore Guraj Rao, was shooting your stuff. He went to Swansea. Yes. And that's when you were looking for somebody to cover your events. I was looking for an opportunity to explore what it is that I can do. And that's how we met Diren, put us in touch. And then the first gig was Angasana, was it? First gig was Angasana. I think it was Fuga? placed on Yes. With Jasmeet. A lot of low light, remember that. It continued to be a couple more low light gigs. Mm. There's this place on Residency Road on the rooftop next to a pool. We did that for Arvind Mills. Yeah. That was a very interesting gig because I, I think even recently someone from Arvind Mills reached out to me. Okay. And we were talking about that gig and I, it's still on your profile so I took Yeah, that's the, the first time somebody spilled alcohol on the camera. That's when I thought maybe parties is not a scene for me to shoot. It was an interesting experience because that was my first ever sort of long-term professional engagement and I'm thankful that it wasn't with a corporate because you wouldn't have gotten the sort of mutual learning experience but it was with another artist and that makes it extremely easy because you were ahead of the curve at that point you had been performing for a long time you had been a freelance artist for a long time mm. and I got a lot of learnings from that which is um, at no point did uh, you ask me to say you know what come shoot for free yeah even if it was uh, I think the lowest we ever went was one gig where you're very upfront about how much you got paid and you said I will cover your expenses and everything else mm. but that was just the one gig but everything else that I shot with you I've got paid for mm. even the ones you didn't get paid which for I'm which is about right now yeah. 
Which is what, I mean, you learn to respect. The things that you learn in the beginning are probably what stick with you the most. You always value your time and work. Though I never really was able to fix that value correctly at the start. Have you done that now? Yeah, uh, yes. since because after you understand the basics of these values, then you can fix a value to it. But without knowing that, it's really hard for you to sort of put a number to it. Hmm. It was sort of know your value, never work for free. And by free, I mean at an expense to you. If there is something that you're taking away from it, and I have even very recently done something that I've shot for free. Hmm. It was something that I wanted to learn from it was sort of a mutual engagement. That sort of stuff is fine. But as long as it satisfies you at the end of the day that you're taking value back from it and that value doesn't have to be money necessarily. Hmm. And valuing somebody else's time, which is what comes from you paying me even though you didn't get paid initially, that sort of sticks with you as well. You want to sort of build a relationship with somebody that goes beyond just that one one time you work together or just a formal thing because but we have done many different things together. We since. have, we have, but you do realize that a lot of people use this let's build a relationship thing to also exploit a lot of artists and I think this is like 95% of the time. I was recently talking to Raghu and Gauravas. They refer to the Raghu Dixit project as a Mercedes Benz and they talk about how people come to the showroom to buy a Mercedes Benz but they say, listen, we uh, can't afford it right now but we would like to afford it so this is how much we can put down for it and they'll say, but to make up for it, we'll build a relationship with you and we'll give you 10 such opportunities yeah. which is basically one car at the end of the day what do you think people need to do to sort of break that? Yeah, that happens a lot, I guess. I mean, people come to you and say, I'll give you the opportunity. Um, and again, you have to take it at face value. A lot mm. of times, I guess, you let your instinct take over and you will go wrong a few times, but that helps you learn more about it. And the thing you say about price is true as well. I mean, predominantly in India, value for money is money. It's not what you get out of it. People compare few things like they would compare commodities. But even there, you get what you pay for. That's sort of just how I approach it. And that's where the importance of saying no comes in. Because I made that mistake initially when I was doing my commercial projects is, like I said, I didn't know how to get paid. And when you start off and you're a freelancer, whatever money comes your way is, you take it, but then you realize you don't grow out of it. And I speak to uh, professional photographers today at different places that I go to, and I see them making the same mistakes and I talk to them about these things. You need to value your time, you need to value all these different things arrive at a value hmm. and not settle for anything below that. That could mean that you do lesser work, but that also gives you certain standard of work that you are doing and it is priced at a certain price. Obviously, you don't go way beyond something that your market can reach. You want it to be within that fair price that justifies the person you're doing it for and for yourself. But the importance of saying no is what it comes down to. I'm sure that's what Raghu and Garo would have said as well. Yeah, yeah. They always say no. Yeah, that's They have a certain important. standard yeah. and they stick by it no matter what. I mean, I didn't know that initially. I mean, I learned that the hard way. We it all took did. me a we year and a half to get out of that pricing. That, that happened when I got sort of more professional help. I sat with not just other photographers, but I sat with people in the event space and all of them said, you know what, this is how you break down cost. This is how you break down what you do. Hmm. Your time is not just what you spend at the shoot, but your time is what you spend yep. pre-production. Your time is what you spend in post your travel all, all of these things yeah. that is basically the time that you're putting in and what do you value that time as so all of those things i learned the hard way very quickly we're, we're going to touch upon your transition out of being that wedding photographer audio photography the wedding photographer could you tell us why you made that shift i very strongly believe that your experiences as a kid is what shapes you to be the kind of adult you are and for me as a kid when i grew up it was always about travel family and experiences mm -hmm. my dad was on a travel job and every time we'd get time as a family was when we would travel, and which is why I love traveling so much. We've seen the pictures. Yeah, and uh, the first thing I ever wanted to be as a kid was a driver or a mechanic, both okay. ideally, but I didn't have the skills to be a mechanic, so I can still drive. And I made a promise to myself back then that I would not give up that interest in driving, which is why I drive to so many places today, and combine all of these things together. So for me, photography still probably comes a little later. Travel and experience is still what is more primary. When somebody asks me who you are, I say I'm a traveler and then a photographer, not a photographer, a photographer right away. Okay. And people get confused by that and put off by it a little bit. They think I'm being pretentious. But that's honestly how I believe that I approach my work. Um, it's an evolution of sorts, a natural evolution yeah. that's happened to you. When I dropped out and then I wanted to sort of figure out what it is that I'm doing. I went shot every single thing, right? And one of the things that you do is take inspiration from all the beautiful images around and you get inspired from and you go try and replicate that. That's that's one of the ways I learned. And I obviously learned a lot more. I've shot film, but I, I learned a lot more when it went digital because you experiment so much. You have that liberty of being able to fail, but continue to learn because you can afford deleting those pictures, which you can't in a small pocket money. And I got a collection of images. And when I was at crossroads about what do I do next, I took up a sort of quirky idea, which is I got in touch with, I used to do a lot of event management jobs. I've handed out leaflets on MG Road. I've held up banners for concerts. I've You've done- been a model. Uh, which is what I'm coming to. Okay. 
So through those channels, I got in touch with people who are model coordinators, and cool. I said, "Hey, you know what? If you need an extra to shoot, I'd love to come down there." Because what you need to understand is, if you're taking it up as a profession, as a hobby, is fine. But as a profession, there is a certain aspect that you need to learn, which is professionalism, and that only comes with interacting with other people in your industry to know exactly how they interact with people, what it is that makes them good at what they do. Oh. So I turned up as an extra to see how they interact, what exactly happens behind the scenes. Kumaran is the name of the photographer that I was in the most shoots with. Okay. Um, he has his office in Infinity Road. He's a really nice guy. Oh. Till now, formal meetings, he turns up in shorts, which is what I'm inspired by as well. Bike rides and shorts. Yeah, bike rides and shorts. We should, we should go get a that. pant. We should. We should. I burnt my leg a little bit. You're getting a little heat burns. Pants, Audi, they're extremely important in life. Yes. I wasn't prepared for a 650 cc bike. It's true. You know? it's true. So, but we'll we'll get something a little bit more powerful later on. Yeah. Okay. Back to you. Okay. <laughs> smooth plug-in. Smooth plug-in. <laughs> so while I was there, and then I started getting to know the, the photographer as well, and then he also noticed that I was taking keen interest in all of these things, oh. and we started building a conversation. And one of the things that I also think is when somebody's doing their work, you don't go disturb them with your things. But when he sat down and he was chilling out, I, I went to him and I said, you know what, I'm really interested in this as well. Yeah. If you are free at any point today or at any point in the near future, can you just let me know? He said, yeah, yeah, please bring your work. So I took my work back to him. And these are the sort of things that go a long way in yeah. shaping the uh, career that you have. Is He looked at my images and said, there are some nice photos, some not so nice photos. But look at these pictures, I don't get what you like shooting. Which till then didn't occur to me, that is what is the most important thing? Yeah. Because Yes, as a photographer who's learned things technically and who knows the basics of photography, you can try and with enough hard work make anything look good. But your images that truly stand out are the ones that you connect with mm. as a subject and you have a passion for. Mm. And then when you execute that as a work, it goes to a whole new level. And he said that's what sort of distinguishes the work that anybody does. Okay. And he had a passion for advertising, he had a passion for portraits and you know he, he had won many awards for campaigns and he was talking to me about his experiences. There were ad agencies who were sitting there who were also talking about the things that they like in a photographer. Yeah. Those are the things that I took. This is even before I started shooting and, with and you. And these people openly had conversations oh, with you? Oh, very openly. Okay. Very openly. Because I've seen you have conversations. Online it's very hard to do, but I think face to face it's a lot more easy for me to talk to somebody. Hmm. From that experience, I then said, you know what, I'm going to try shooting everything. So I shot parties as well, but I stopped shooting after that one tequila incident. Hmm. A vodka, I don't remember. No, but you did do a few other parties. But it wasn't a party party. That was a pool party that okay, one that was a pool party yeah. but you also did the new year party if i remember right because so but that wasn't a, a party like that because i was shooting rasta cafe and the party happened to be there so they lit up the entire place and that mm. was sort of what i was getting there okay so it was a sort of very different way of shooting a, okay. a party and i was just exploring every single avenue that i had mm. weddings coming back to what you asked me was something that happened by chance i am relatively reserved in a shy guy it's very hard for me to open up to somebody right away and now I'm a lot better because I understand the importance of being able to talk to somebody but back then it was much harder for me. So the weddings that I started shooting were actually those of friends, friends. of friends of friends right. So the first one was my cousin brother which is where I just just got the DSLR and then I was just trying stuff out. Which but then, was your first DSLR? Uh, Canon 500 Which I bought after saving over a year and a half. Few with people my, are smiling <laughs> here by the way. Everyone which I bought there. after saving for almost two years with my charter country stipend mm. with help from my mum putting it in a mutual fund in her name which got extremely good returns mm. she put in a little bit remaining and then I got the camera so when people think I, I get it easy I really haven't so Vivek known Polio. as Polio his sister's wedding is actually the first wedding that I shot a week later a friend of his from college who were all sort of common friends and I'd met them at some point we were still in that circle but at some point it got to a point where it left that first and second circle and other people started seeing my work because I was sharing it online. Till today I've not shared too many wedding photos but then it was something exciting. I shot weddings and it, people that I shot it for really liked it so I put it up, word got around and then I started shooting weddings after weddings after weddings. Weddings are good money. It's India. Indians spend a lot on their weddings and there's no dearth of weddings in India. It got to a point where um, I wasn't connecting with the weddings that I was shooting anymore. There were, tens of thousands of people. It went from, you know, knowing the people that I'm shooting who had a story and it was fun. Once that started happening and you see that take an effect on your images, you don't connect with it. Mm. After a point, it becomes mechanical. You start shooting the same sort of images. That's not fair, fair to you, but more important, it's not fair to the people that are paying for you. So I made a very conscious decision and just one day I put a hard stop on the whole thing, mm. which was a very tough decision to make because that was 
probably 80-85% of my income at that point. It obviously took a huge hit on my, the way money came in, but it was also a good sort of learning experience as to, you can still make other things work. Uh, because it, at the end of it, it all came back to one thing, hmm. that I relate most to travel. And it's all because of my experience as a kid, because those are the experiences that I truly enjoy. That I can completely do. The first time I did that, my dad wasn't too keen on what I did because he didn't know if I can do it. But when he saw that I had the heart to go through with what my decision was, even though he knew that I wasn't, I was giving up so much money, he knew that I would somehow make it work. So then I even had the support of my family entirely. So that made it extremely easy. That was my sort of switch from that to this. It's been a sort of up and down journey, but now I'm find, finding a way to make travel a sustainable way of making my work. But I've not stopped shooting weddings entirely. Okay. I shot my cousin's wedding a while back. Okay. I do that, but I just don't talk about it. So you've figured out a way to balance your professional It's not a commercial job at all. A lot of you shows through your pictures, right? So we've seen a lot of your doggy boy in yeah. there. And there's your love for animals that cuts through. And many years ago, I remember you doing some work with NGOs that supported animal welfare. From when I was a kid, I think my mom and dad are sort of both, animal. they love animals. But yeah. the thing being, because we were in school, both of them are working parents. There's no time to take care of a pet. But as sort of timing and work got more flexible and then people could be at home at different parts of time as well. It's, otherwise, it's unfair to bring a pet home and then not give it time. So we make sure that somebody is there not more than probably two hours is the maximum. He's alone he's at home alone. now. I absolutely love animals. Uh, now he's probably the most important member in the family. Whenever we can, we do road trips and stuff like that. So according to you, what is success so far? I guess for me, the definition of success has been changing ever so slightly as I grow and learn more about the world. I guess the broader definition for me is as long as I'm happy doing it, as long as it is good for all the people that I love and around me, if I'm doing it commercially, the people that I'm doing it for are happy. That for me is success at the end of the day. That's probably the most important part. This was part one of a two-part episode. If you liked what you saw, or if you would like to see more of these stories, make sure you subscribe right here. We will see you next week in part two. This is On a Tank of Fuel.